Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Deep Water Wednesday. Since um, Rex has uh, gone to heaven, I am now. Um, I now have Betty is playing the part of Roxella, and we are going to. Um, or Jack, not Rex, Jack. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and take the, the spot of Jack and Roxella. So I hope you guys are all ready. Praise the Lord. It's a good day, isn't it? Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I hope so. We want to get started right away because we've got a, a really interesting lesson. We're going to get started off in, in the book of Exodus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, show us Jesus tonight. As we look in, in the book of Exodus, Father, we begin this great book. Just open up your word to us. Show us yourself. Show us your characteristics. Show us who, we, who it is that we worship and honor. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for being with us. We thank you for the health of your people. We thank you, Lord God, that every single one of the people at Messiah Community Church has a hedge around them, Lord God. No plague or pestilence shall bother them. And Lord God, they abide under the shadow of the Most High. Your wings cover them about, Lord God. And they are indeed a healthy people, Lord God, prosperous in the way of the Lord. And we just thank you for it. We praise you for it. Thank you for your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, everybody, for jumping on. Um, we are going to um, get started in the book of Exodus. Now, we spent a good bit of time, like weeks and weeks in Genesis, and we saw a lot of God's character and also a lot of, of who uh, Jesus is because we, we got to see appearances of Jesus. Well, the book of Exodus is chock full of appearances of Jesus and not just appearances of Jesus, but like types and shadows that we can follow along. And, and we're, we're going to see a lot of who God really is in, through the book of Exodus, in, including that name that's on my screen right now. And so let's get started. Exodus chapter 1, verse 7. But the children of Israel were fruitful and exceeding in it and increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now, this is a verse right from the, the first chapter of Exodus. Um, we see the results of the children of Israel being under the blessing of the Almighty Creator. They, they go to Egypt. Egypt is typology for the world, and, and yet they go there. They're, they're actually in Egypt. So, so they actually, the Lord instructs them, in fact, to go into the world. Now, there's a lot of believers who will say, oh, I can't go to this place. I can't go to that place. I can't get this help. I can't get that help. I shouldn't do this, that, because, you know, otherwise my, I'm not showing my faith or there's something wrong with me or people are going to criticize me because I'm not relying upon God. Listen, there are times when God tells you to go to places that we might say, oh, well, well that's the world, you know. That's the world. Can't go there. And God says, go there because there I'm going to bless you. Now think about that for a minute. Think about that just for a minute. Because when Jesus was speaking to the people, um, one of his first messages, he, he is, is telling them that um, all the things that the Gentiles seek your heavenly Father knows you have need of. Well, wait a minute. Gentiles are unbelievers. And God knows we have the same needs as the unbelievers? Well, you like to eat, don't you? Sometimes ice cream and other stuff too, right? Uh, we're not just all eating kosher diets out of the, the, you know, the book of, of uh, Deuteronomy. We, we are, in fact in need of things, and they are the same exact needs as people in the world. We all have a need of, of a roof over our head. We all have a need of transportation. We all have a need of all kinds of things. And, and so for us to not understand or to somehow say, oh, well, this, um, them going to Egypt, 
you know, it was for punishment, it was for this, it was for that. Listen, get that out of your head. The Lord had a plan. He sent his people there to save them alive. That's what Joseph said. That's how we left off last week. The Lord sent them there to be saved alive. Here we see the results of the blessing of God. And this is the destiny of those who abide under the shadow of the Most High. They are going to be blessed. They are going to increase abundantly, multiply, and grow exceedingly mighty. In church history, the body of Christ was a powerful organism changing countries, governments, and being a worldwide influencer of culture, morality, and art. That's who we were. The church was not a weak and feckless organization, uh, even though there was persecutions and all that kind of stuff that happened. The church, when it started, was not this weak and feckless organization. It would have never taken over and rooted in the countries it rooted in to begin with. It went to an idol worshiping, the, the, the faith with under Christians went into an idol worshiping place called Mesopotamia, filled with idols. The people there worship Greek gods and, and the Egyptian gods, and kind of a combination of the whole thing. And the church within a century had taken over that entire area, and Christianity was such a big thing that Rome was threatened by it. By the time we get to Nero and some of the emperors after him, these guys were dirty, vicious people who nearly destroyed, nearly destroyed um, all of, of um, Christianity through persecution and stuff, because they were so threatened. And in the end, by 300 plus AD, the, the emperor of Rome, the, the Caesar of Rome, ended up giving his life to the Lord and becoming a Christian, and then tried to convert by force, in a lot of cases, the entire known Roman Empire at the time to Christianity. So don't think that Christianity started out as this this humble little, uh, we don't have any power, we don't have any authority, we don't have any rule, we don't have any anything, we're just supposed to be humble and get walked over by everybody, because it never started out that way. And in fact, it didn't become like that until later on. Look at Exodus 1, 8 through 10. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Hey, Mike Kelker, you might try logging off and coming back in and see if that helps you. Get a picture. I don't know why you, you wouldn't have a picture, um, because it's being broadcast as both. This same thing happened to the body of Christ, but for a much longer period of time. The body of Christ has gone through centuries and centuries of being in the dark. We called it the dark ages to start with. But through the help of the pulpit, a message was preached to the body of Christ that basically said we're supposed to be poor. We're not supposed to have anything. If we have something, we must have gotten it from the devil. There went out a message that says that Christians should be walked over. We should never say anything. It, we, you know, somebody comes up and slaps us uh, on, the, on the cheek. We should just turn the other cheek and say, here, come on, go ahead and slap as hard as you want on the other one. We, because of our lack of, of understanding of, of Hebrew culture, which is the time that the scriptures are written in. And, and our lack of understanding of the people of, of Israel at the time that Jesus was there, many of the things that Jesus taught, we just simply don't understand, like the whole slapping with the hand. If you were slapped, it, and it says, if a man slaps you with the right hand, and he slaps you on the cheek, the right cheek, 
Well, he, he has uh, put you under him, so to speak. But it says, if you turn the other cheek to him, what you're saying is, uh-uh, I'm on the same level as you, so go ahead. Because now he's got to sleep, slap you with the left hand. To slap somebody with the left hand was not permitted in Hebrew law. Ooh. So you've just leveled yourself with whoever it was. That was a very aggressive thing at the time. When Jesus taught that, we think, oh, Jesus taught us we should turn the other cheek and just let him beat the pulp out of us. That's not at all what he was teaching. He wasn't teaching for us to, to turn, haul off and slug him. He was teaching us to look at him in the eye and say, go ahead and slap the other one because I'm as strong as you are. Interesting, isn't it? Now, the same thing that's happened to the body of Christ over a long period of time happened to Israel right here. The kings forgot, or the pharaohs forgot, all the stuff that Joseph had done. They forgot all the good stuff because that's how Joseph won the heart of Pharaoh to begin with. He took care of the nation of Egypt. He won their hearts because he saved their lives. That's the same way that we will win the world today. We will win their hearts because we save their lives. Not because we put them down, not because we judge them. Over time, the church became corrupt, and the message of the cross and the resurrection compromised, and the saints beat down by a new law of works, not grace. And it became all about control, religion. Exodus 1, 11 through 14. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. Get this, the children of Israel, that they were making this place boom. They, they were building stuff. They were building silos and granaries and, and great uh, buildings and, and great cities in Egypt. And the children of Israel were very prosperous, and they kept multiplying. They went in just 12 families. By this time around, there are millions of people. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. They were trying just to enslave them and beat them down. The church has always has also been put under bondage and hard labor. It's been brutally enslaved and persecuted over the centuries. Millions have become martyrs. Millions. And the, the body of Christ has taken a position much like the, the uh, Hebrew children at the time. Even though they had multiplied and they were millions and millions, and they scared the bejeebers out of the Egyptians. They thought they might rise up and take over the whole nation. Instead, the people subdued themselves and put themselves under bondage. They didn't have to. They could have kept being good. And the implication with a lot of these scriptures and, and other writings that, that go along with these from the, um, from the rabbis and the teachers of the law back in the time, they, they imply that the children of Israel began to despise the Egyptian people. Instead of being where Joseph was, where they appreciated them, were good to them and, and blessed them, they stopped doing that. Pretty soon they had become a nation that was speaking the language of the Egyptians, acting like the Egyptians, trading like the Egyptians, doing everything like the Egyptians. And yet they were, they were over in this other part of Egypt because they were shepherds and they were just kind of like coming in the city, building things for them. And they became slave labor. Now, Revelation 17, 6 to 8, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, why did, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast, 
that was and is not and yet is. Here we see in the book of Revelation, it talks about the martyrs. It talks about all those people who went on to be with Jesus because of the faith. And they're crying out and they're saying, Jesus, when are you going to avenge us? When, when are you going to go down there and avenge us? And the beast, that they, they marvel at the beast, and, and yet the beast really isn't, the, in fact, the beast and the great harlot, their religion and their evil. And the, the body of Christ actually has dominion over them and doesn't recognize and doesn't know it. Many in the body of Christ have died many times needlessly under a message that said we should be humble, meaning, which really means weak and powerless. This was not the message that Jesus preached. In fact, his message was radical, yet not harmful, not vicious. It was radical because it preached a love that would conquer, a love that would take over. From the beginning, the people who followed God were powerful and only became weak and powerless after they failed at the law. While under grace, all God's people prospered. Go back to the beginning. Everybody under grace prospered. All the way up to the time the law came. And then when they came to a period after they were under the law, and, and it was tough for them then. But then David comes along. And we'll get to him much later on. But David comes along. David is a man of grace. They wanted law. They wanted Saul law. But then that God gave them David after Saul, who was a man of grace. And the kingdom prospered like had never happened before. And then under Solomon, his son, another man of grace, didn't implement a whole bunch of law. And, and the nation just continued to prosper. And it wasn't until they went back to law that the nation fell again. But every time the nation of Israel was under grace, the, from Abraham on up, every time they're under grace, they prosper. Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Jacob all became people of great wealth, great substance, uh, great increase in the lives that were with them. Every time they were under grace. In Egypt, they forgot their heritage. And they became slaves until the deliverer appeared, Moses. Take a look at Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. We're looking at words in red. It means Jesus spoke them. Here we see the words of Jesus as he tells the disciples that all things written in the law and the prophets were things concerning him. Pardon the typo. In Moses, we will see a clear picture of a type of Christ the deliverer. It's time we, the church, ask ourselves, who are we in this present time? Really, we, we need to. We need to, act, we need to really take a look and say to ourselves, the body of Christ, who are we in this present time? Are we what the book of Acts started? Or are we something else that has evolved not upward but downward? Not toward power but toward weakness. Not toward faith but toward fear. Are we the weak, feckless Israelites leaving Egypt? Or the sinning, thoughtless ones in the desert? Or perhaps we're the powerfully humble Joseph. Joseph wasn't weak. Joseph was humble and powerful. He became the most powerful person other than Pharaoh in the nation of Egypt. Later, after he left office, and it and died. They quit. They quit thinking about all the good that he did. But the, it was the good that he did that was power. Moses or Moshe, meaning drawing out of the water or rescued, is the author of the first five books of the Bible known as the Pentateuch or the Torah for for the Hebrew people. It is affectionately called the Law. 
The law was given at the request of the Israelites because they refused grace, deciding they needed to work in order to earn God's favor. All this was to bring about the coming of Messiah, Jesus the Christ. All of that was for that purpose. Good word, Mike. Mike uh, Kelker says, we're sons of the Most High and have authority over the enemy, but maintaining our humbleness. That's exactly right. We, because it, our humility is drawn from understanding that without Christ, we're, we're not any better off than anybody else. Without Christ, we're, we're no more powerful. We're nothing without him. It all comes because of Jesus. But in Christ, we have a place that no other being on the planet has. Otherwise, why would the Lord call us priests and kings? Why would he set us in the positions that he sets us in? Why would he put gifts and talents and abilities in the, into the people of God that everybody doesn't just walk around with? Why would he do things and, and give things to the body of Christ that are, are not blessings on just everybody. There are so many things that we are given that you can't buy in the world. You can't psych yourself into. You can't believe yourself into. You, you can't go and work your way into or buy your way into. Like peace. You can have peace that passes all understanding no matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing. You can have the peace that passes all understanding. It doesn't make any difference how much money you have or don't have. It doesn't make any difference what your education level is. Somebody with the best education that money can buy, they can have three or four MIT doctorates. They can have all the money that could possibly be had, be a multi, multi billionaire, and still not have any peace. Because those things don't buy you peace. Only the Spirit of God can give you peace. Galatians 3, 24 and 25 says this, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. The, the law wasn't there to push us away from Christ. The law was there to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. Now. In John chapter 1, verse 17, it says this, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We're going to see a little bit later on. When the law comes in, 3,000 people die. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit comes in, and 3,000 people get born again. It, it, the, I mean, the... The types and shadows and the things that we see through the scriptures, through the Old Testament, are phenomenal. In Exodus 2, 5 through 10, Mike says, We don't lard, lord over those who are learning or don't know Christ so they can see and witness the greatness through him who saved us by grace and faith in him. Ex exactly, that's the point. We're not in a position to lord over anybody. We're in a position of power to show grace. To, to show the goodness of God. Because it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. Repentance doesn't mean draw them to lay on the ground and cry and beg for forgiveness. Repentance means for them to change their mind about what they think about God. If they think God is some wicked judge, I mean, I've I've been uh, told by people, have heard people, well-educated people, well-meaning people, good people say, well, if God is so good, why does this and this and this exist? Why do, you know, why do these people die? Why is there this in the world? Why is there that in the world? If God is so good, and most of those people, what they have in their mind is God a judge? They don't realize that God has already judged. He judged sin. He judged the world. And he found man worthy of salvation. Check out Exodus 
2, 5 through 10. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Moses came into this world receiving favor with God and man. Jesus came into the world having favor with God and man. In fact, the word says that he grew in favor with God and man. In Luke 2, 52, it, it, says he, it, it actually says he increased in wisdom and stature and, and in favor with God and man, which, which the word increased actually means increased. It means he had it to start with, and then he increased. Moses had it to start with because he was blessed. And then he increased. Pharaoh's daughter wasn't just, um, you know, she, she wasn't just liking babies. She had an affection for Moses. She, she actually saw him, and the Spirit of God caused her to feel that same pull. Moses and Jesus were faced with a death sentence from the birth, from the a death sentence from the king at their births. Pharaoh made a decree that all males who would open the womb shall be cast in the river. Matthew 2.16 says this, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put, a death, put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all the districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. One thing we can understand from Scripture, and this follows all the way through, before every great event in the history of God, there has been a decree to kill the babies. Every time. It, I mean, it, it's all through Scripture that way. Every time there is a decree to kill the babies, we need to understand God is doing something. God isn't in the killing of the babies. Don't mistake me on that. He, he's, not, he's not directing that. He knows it's coming. It's coming because of something the enemy is trying to stop. In the case of Moses, the devil was trying to stop Moses from delivering the children of Israel. He was trying to stop them. In the case of Jesus, the devil was trying to stop the deliverer of all mankind from coming. In both cases, we find the enemy killing the children. One of the, the uh, traits of those who worship Baal was that they killed children. Makes you want to think about today's people, right? And, and all the um, supposedly, you know, modern countries, not third world countries, but all the civilized nations of the world. Listen, the uncivilized nations of the world, they don't, they don't have abortions. Not legalized, not, uh, not where it's dictated by the government, paid for by the government or anything else. They value life. In, in the big world nations, us, Russia, China, uh, Eastern Europe, all the educated places, good for Mexico, Mike. Maybe that, maybe that means you're still third world down there. The, in, in the uncivilized nations of, or in the civilized nations of the world, we have that happen in China. China, they regularly kill children control population that way. That's just something to think about. That was just a sidebar. Take a look at Exodus 2, 13, or 12 and four, through 14. So he looked this way and that way. This is Moses. Moses has grown up now. And Moses is, he's already been trained up. The, the scriptures tell us, and, and, uh, extra biblical writings of the rabbis and that, uh, they, they tell us that Moses uh, became a great, great person in the nation of Egypt. He, he grew up as one of Pharaoh's own. And, and as he grew up, he, he went to all the finest schools in Egypt. This is a well-educated guy. That, but this is also a guy who realizes he's, he's an Israelite. And so he now he's confronted. He's confronted with a with a situation. 
and this so is talking about Moses here. So Moses looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid, hid him in the sand. The Egyptian was, was beaten up on, a, on an Israelite. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did wrong, why are you striking your companion? Then he said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Both Jesus and Moses were betrayed by the brethren. Another type of Christ. Another incident where we see Moses like Jesus. Both were betrayed by their brethren, both accused of being a judge over the people of Israel, yet both were ultimately the deliverer of Israel. Isn't that how things work, though? Um, I mean, you you can do all kinds of things, but as soon as you uh, pull rank on somebody in, in the church, well, who are you to judge me? Isn't that how it works? Man, I wish we'd all walk around without offense on our shoulders all the time. It'd be a whole lot easier to live in Christianity. I can tell you that. This next verse is an interesting and overlooked verse regarding Moses being a type of Christ. And and we're going to get into some deep stuff here, so just get ready. The Midianites were descendants of Abraham by a second wife. In other words, they would be Gentiles or the not chosen. They're, understand here, though, that the Midianites do worship the same God. Their, um, the, the father of the Midianites, so to speak, was Abraham. And so, I mean, I know we're generations past here, but the Midianites, um, they come along they're worshiping God. Maybe not exactly the same as the Hebrew people are, but they have the same background. They had the same father. They had, you think Abraham, you know, taught Isaac everything, but uh, when he married his second wife, uh, Keturah, that that he didn't, um, he didn't teach her anything. He didn't tell her anything about God. He didn't tell any of his kids that he hid by her anything about God. No, he taught them all, but they weren't the chosen one. They weren't the promised children that, that God had promised him. That was Isaac. But they, they still were under the blessing because they still worship God. Take a look here at Exodus 2, 16 and 17. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. This is kind of a this kind of a cool verse. It's the shepherds that drive the daughters away from the water, but Moses that helps them get the water. The priest of religion drive the people away from the water of the word, but it's Jesus that draws them near. Woo! See why I said this is kind of overlooked, but but yet it's a real interesting verse. Because the Midianite daughters, the, the priest of Midian, their his seven daughters are coming to draw water for their flocks. It's the shepherds that drive them away from that. You would think shepherds would want them to get water for the flocks. Nope. It's the same way religion is. It's the way it is in, in Christianity in a lot of places. People come, they want, to, they want to get a real drink of water. I mean, they, they want to have the water of the word. And yet, it, it's, the, it's the very teachers that are supposed to bring them to the water that drive them from the water. It's what happened in the Dark Ages. The, the, the church at the time, under uh, Constantine's church, at the time said, The people are too stupid to have the word. They can't understand it. Only we can understand it. Only we, the priests, can understand it. We'll take the word from them. In other words, they're not allowed to have the water of the word. They're not allowed to find it out for themselves. They're not allowed to get in in it because they're just too dumb to understand it. And we'll tell them what this means. 
We'll give them what we want to give them, what we want them to know. And it's all about control. What God intended was for all of us to come to the water of the word, drink for ourselves, draw that we would be able to draw water for our own flocks. Yeah, Ed, it was all about keeping them ignorant. And that's just a, a little snippet of how Moses comes in and Moses drives away the shepherds and says, come on, I'll help you with the water. I'll help you get water for the flocks. That's what a real deliverer does. That's what a real shepherd does. A real shepherd helps other people get water. Get the water of the word. Get it down in them. Drink of it. If you're not being taught the word, if you're not being taught what Jesus was, was meaning to teach us, if, if you're not being taught the, the depth of, the, of uh, Christianity through the Gospels, not through some book or some somebody's opinions, but actually through the through the Word of God. If you're not being taught that, then you need to get out of that place. We need to bring people to the Word. Exodus two eighteen through twenty. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, "How is it that you've come so soon today?" In other words, they went to the well. They got back a lot quicker because Moses helped them. And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. And he also drew, oh, so he said to his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Now, I said this back in Genesis. We keep seeing this come up over and over. And people wonder, how come you guys have communion every Sunday? Well, I can tell you why. Communion is all through the Word. There, every time you run into people of God, they're breaking bread. Why would Jesus tell us every time we gather together in his name, break bread? There is something about that communion that creates a, a synergy of faith, a, 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 a connection with the hearts and the lives you're breaking bread with. This time the communion is called for by the priest of Midian, Ruel, uh, whose Ruel means friend of God. The Midianites in that day worshiped the God of Abraham, but they weren't the chosen people. Think about this again. Moses went to the Gentiles, so to speak. He didn't go first to the Israelites. He went to the Gentiles. Jesus came, went first to the Israelites, then went to the Gentiles. Yep, yeah, it's exactly right. Having communion is solidification of the people with the Spirit. It's exactly what it is. It it it's a um it, it's like a sharing of DNA, you know? We, we, we come into a sameness with each other. We, we have something that we, we all agree upon, that we all share, the broken body of Jesus. And that's what it is. Then Moses was content to live with the man. This is talking about Ruel, the Midianite. And he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses, and she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Jesus ultimately came to bring Israel back to God in grace. In the meantime, he's content to be with us, his offspring, or, or Gershom, meaning a refugee in Hebrew. The Gentile church is, is a refugee. But we're going to be grafted into the vine to become chosen as a nation of Israel's chosen. See, Jesus is, when, when Jesus came back, Jesus came back ultimately for the nation of Israel, the chosen generation or the chosen people. They refused him. So then he went to the Gentile nation. Moses was refused at first. He goes to the Gentile nation, the Midianites. 
Then he goes back to Israel. Jesus goes to Israel. Then he, he gets preached to the Gentiles. The Gentiles receive him. The Gentiles church starts. But ultimately, in the end, Jesus will come back and bring all of Israel will be saved. But they're only going to be brought back by the goodness of God. They're not going to be brought back by judgment. They're not going to be brought back by any of it. They're going to be brought back because they, they, they're going to realize that they missed. They missed the greatest blessing ever to be. They missed Jesus. Take a look here at Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Jethro is another name for uh, Ruel, um, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, now we want to talk about this, and, and I, I got a bunch of questions here for you because I, I want to see where you're at. So get ready to type. Now, this interesting verse comes alive in the names given in it. Jethro is also Ruel, a priest of the Midianites. His name means his excellence. So Moses is tending the flocks of his excellence, the Midianite priest. Moses is, um, he's doing exactly what Jesus is doing with his church as the great shepherd. He's tending the flocks of his excellence, the almighty God. He comes to the backside of the desert and the mountain of God called Horeb. Horeb means desolate. Now, here's an interesting thing. God is not always found in the spark on glamour. His home is often in a desolate place. Now, my first question to you is, why is God found in a desolate place? Why does he go to the mountain of God, the Israelites and the Midianites, both believers, both believe in the God of Abraham. They call this mountain Horeb, Horeb meaning desolate, but its nickname is the mountain of God. He leads them to the mountain of God. What, what's that mean? What does that mean that the mountain of God's name, Horeb, means desolate? Is God desolate? Oh, come on. Some of you guys got to think about that, right? Yeah. Betty brings up a good point. It says, and he led the flock to the back backside of the desert or the back of the desert. I didn't know a desert had a front and a back. <laughs> oh, Nancy. Nancy says it's when we're desolate that we seek his face. Mindy says, God always meets you when you are at your lone, loneliest place. Hmm. All right, keep all those in mind. Anybody else? All right, let's go on. I want you to pay attention to this backside of the desert. And I want you to pay attention to the, the mountain of God was named Horeb or desolate. Mark chapter 1, 43 and 45. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Now, we find this all the time with Jesus, all the time with Jesus. Jesus often goes to deserted places, and there the people follow him. He also went to the desert place after being baptized by John. Why do we find Jesus going off to the desert places for prayer? 
I mean, he's overwhelmed by the people. He heals this guy. He tells the guy, don't tell anybody. The guy goes and tells everybody. And the people flock to Jesus. Jesus leaves the people who are flocking to him. And he goes to the backside of the desert. He goes to a deserted place. He goes to a place of loneliness, a place of of, uh, being alone, as we think, right? But the people follow him there. Why aren't they afraid to follow him there? Why, Why do they go after him in that place? Yeah, Ed, he... He goes, it, it seems like what we understand, he goes there to be alone, right? But then the people follow him. Why didn't he go hide somewhere? Why didn't he go find a tomb to get in? Nobody would follow him there. Why, did, why didn't he go someplace people couldn't follow him? Why does he take his disciples into desert places and sit them down and teach them? Mike says, so so Jesus won't be distracted and he only has the people who have faith in him. Ah, okay. When Jesus is tempted by the devil, he is led by the spirit into the wilderness. Now, how many have heard things like this? Good point, Bridget. Because he says he's the living water. Most people, and and I've heard this a lot, and you guys probably have too. Oh, they're just going through the wilderness right now. Oh, they're just in a desert place. They'll find themselves. They'll be out. You know, God will meet them there somewhere and drag their butts out of the desert place, right? Oh, Nancy says, so, so it, um, so, or perhaps it's so the people won't be distracted. Hmm, good point. So when Jesus is tempted by the devil, he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Wilderness and desert place, by the way, are exactly the same word. In, in, in Hebrew, or pardon me, in Greek, as well as in Hebrew, The same word is used for both. It's just translated. The translators just translated it differently. I don't know why they do that, but they did. But it's exactly the same Greek word and same exact Hebrew word translated two different ways. One desert, one wilderness. Is the wilderness a place where we don't want to be or a place where we do need to be from time to time? Mike says, in the desert, we can cleanse ourselves of all impurities that corrupt our hearts. Ah, I like that, too. Which place is the wilderness a place we don't, we don't ever want to be because that means we're just doing bad? We got to find ourselves. We got to, you know, all those things. Or is it actually a place we need to be from time to time? Why did he leave John the Baptist? He had just gotten baptized. The Spirit of God just came down on him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased to go to a desert place. How does this desert place or wilderness on the backside of the desert where Moses meets Jesus in the burning bush figure into Jesus going into a similar place to be tempted of the devil? Or how about to pray when the, not the crown, I meant the crowd, overwhelms him. He goes there to pray when the crowd overwhelms him. Or leading his disciples there to teach them. How do those two pictures, Moses, and we've all seen, you know, the, the greatest movie ever, ever produced, you know, with Charlton Heston. And he goes to the backside of the desert. He's got some sheep with him, nobody else. He sees a bush. The bush is on fire, but it's not burning. He kneels down before it. God tells him, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. The bush doesn't burn. He's, he's caught up in that, and he's given the message he's going to be the great deliverer, right? 
how does that picture relate to Jesus going to the backside of the desert to be tempted of the devil or to pray after he's overwhelmed by the crowds and then healing people in the, in the wilderness or taking his disciples there to, to pray with them, to teach them. Mike Kelker says we need to be there so we don't rely on ourselves, but lean and trust in the one who created everything. Ooh, now we're getting there, Mike. All right. Take a look at Matthew 11, 7 through 10. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John. Now, this is John the Baptist, right? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Think about this now. The people went, and they went out to the wilderness to hear John preach. John preached a rough message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your mind, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus questions them about why they went there, he says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? He's putting them on Front Street. Did you go out there to hear a nice, soft message? Did you go out there to hear a little religion? Or did you go out there to hear the truth? Did you go there to hear the truth? You went there because you knew a prophet was there. Yeah, and he was more than a prophet. Amen, Richard. Jesus was the prophet foretold by Moses. And John would speak of Jesus. He prepared the way for him, for all humankind, right? So what did they go out there to see? Did they go out there to see religion or did they go out there to see a prophet? What were they wanting from that experience? Good word, Bridget. Bridget says, that, that's why I said, the living water, when in the desert, you're thirsty. You go to the desert, you're wanting the water, right? You're wanting, you're wanting that. Yeah, and you're wanting to know the truth. You didn't go out because you were looking for the guy with soft clothes who's going to pedal you some, some flower petals, right? You went out there because you wanted to know the truth. Luke 15, 4 says this, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. The wilderness, I don't ever remember seeing that in that scripture. I thought he left them in a pasture. He left these 99 sheep in the wilderness. So the other one ran off into the wilderness, not the 99, right? No, no, no. Take a look here. Good, Mindy. It's where God is. He leaves the 99 in the wilderness because that's where God's at. The Hebrew word midbar denotes not a barren desert, but a district or region suitable for pasturing sheep and cattle. That's it. As people, we get swayed by glitz and glamour, nice things, not bad in and of themselves, but they become a religion. That, that, is, a, that is a big part of it, Nancy. We go out to the wilderness. The, the wilderness is a place of grazing, drink, recuperate, grow, find peace. Could this be the opposite of what we have all thought about this place of loneliness and despair being abandoned by God? Maybe this is the quiet, restful place where we can actually concentrate on hearing his voice. The scriptures talk about it, us going into a quiet place into a quiet place 
to get to that place where it's us and God. That's a good point. God never leaves us nor forsakes us. And so we don't really have to go around finding him, do we? What we do have to do is exactly that. Be still and know that I'm God. God's not limited, Mike. He is omnipresent. He's everywhere. What we don't know is what Jesus knew. Jesus wasn't going out to the wilderness to find God. Jesus was going out to the wilderness to find pasture, to to find peace, to get away from the religious noise, to get away from all the stuff that distracts, to get in the presence of his Father, where he wasn't distracted by the religion of the day, the word of the day, the prophet of the day, the, the voice of the day. The people recognized something was happening out there. And do you know that every time the people went out there, Jesus healed them all? He, he touched them all. He preached his greatest sermons when he was away from the people. I mean, when he was away from the crowd, from the city, when he was in the wilderness, when he was away from, from the glitz and the glamour of religion. And yeah, he does go off by himself to pray. That's an ex- excellent point, Nancy. You can't, you, you can't hear the still small voice when you're distracted because you're surrounded by noise and static. We need to be in the wilderness. Listen, when they left Egypt, we're going to see, and as we get into next week, we're going to see as they left Egypt, God took them right into the wilderness. Why? Why did he take them to the wilderness? It's a district suitable for pasturing sheep and cattle. What happens when sheep and cattle pasture? They eat. And they eat good food. They drink. They drink clean water. They grow. They get healthy. There's room enough for them to exercise, to move around, and to experience that private time, that quiet time. Yeah, there there was. Um, he was away from the religious body of the day, and that is exactly what people need to be today. Man, we need churches that'll be wilderness. Honestly, we we need churches that'll be wilderness. Maybe we maybe we would find or he, not find, but hear God more. If if we ended up in a in a place where uh, we were on the backside of the desert. The backside denotes that he was away from everything else. He was away from all the stuff going on on the front side. He was at the backside. When you get away from all of that, all of the world of religiosity, and you get to the backside, you'll find you can hear and you can see. Moses just didn't hear Jesus in the burning bush. He saw him. He had an experience that would change his life forever, and he understood exactly what it meant. He became equipped to go and do what God had told him to do. It is a place, that backside of the desert, that that, uh, desert place or the wilderness is a place of equipping. And it's a place of growth. And it's a great place of faith. Jesus didn't come out of the wilderness after 40 days without food or water. And being tempted of the devil, he didn't come out weak and unable to move. But he came out strong, powerful, to be the king of kings and lord of lords, to go through what he would need to go through to redeem all mankind. It's an interesting thought, and it's a good place to be. I hope you got something out of this tonight. I hope you find your desert place. Oh, yeah.
We, we need to have Justin do that, that, that song, Away, Away from the Noise. Yeah. Betty just reminded me of that. It, it's, it's good. It is good. Listen, the Lord is going to take you the rest of this week. He's going to get you in a quiet place, a place of the wilderness where you're going to hear him. Open up your ears. Let the Lord speak to you. Sing songs of worship. One of the things that I noticed about Moses, he's tending to the sheep when he runs into God. Tend to the sheep. Tend to those that are around you. And watch what God does in your life. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray, Lord God, tonight for the people of Messiah Community Church. Father, we pray, Lord God, that you would take each and every one of us to the backside of the desert. Father, we know now it's not a place of correction, a place, Lord God, of rebuke, but it is a place, Lord God, where you where you teach us, you groom us, you bring us into position to understand who you are, to be quiet and know that you are God, to know your voice, to hear the voice of the shepherd. It's a place of service for us, Father, where we tend to the sheep. It's a place, Lord God, where we thirst and we find drink. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you're blessing this nation, blessing our church, blessing the body of Christ. Father, we thank you that you're blessing the nation of Israel. Bless them, Lord God, in this time of of trial worldwide. Bless all the believers, wherever they might be in this world. Father, whether in persecution or in plenty, bless them, Lord God. Let them be a light in the midst of darkness. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. We give you glory and honor for it. And all the folks said, amen. Listen, next week, we're going to be into... uh, the next couple chapters where the nation of Israel gets delivered. And I'm telling you, there are some really, really good types and shadows in there and some really good appearances of God. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, be blessed of the Lord. Walk in his grace.